Well, how's everyone doing tonight? You awake? You alive? I know the, the snow can be a little shocking, shock us in a different way. Um, I'm preaching off a MacBook, so if some of you think I'm a heathen, I apologize. Uh, I have, I have a, a Bible, don't worry. I don't just use my MacBook, but let's pray, and then we'll get into the Word of God. Jesus, we just thank you for tonight. God, I thank you so much for the word that you have, not from me, but through me. God, move me out of the way. May your will be done. We worship you, God, in this place. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, We are continuing the series on the character of Christmas. And so last week, Pastor Brian shared a timely message about Joseph uh, and the character that Joseph showed. And, And so I'm talking about Mary tonight. And uh, I knew I needed to talk about Mary, so I kind of sat down and was like, well, what, what, you know, at first glance, first thought, what, um, what character does Mary show through, the, through the, the story of Christmas? What, you know, so many things come to mind, right? She's just an amazing woman, as she's been, even through history, just, you know, put on a pedestal. And so I'm trying to think, what stands out the most? And I asked my wife, and she said, well, faith, duh. Faith, obviously. And that one sticks out so much. Uh, There's so many traits that she has, but faith, her character of faith and who she was uh, and what she did is so strong and so powerful. And uh, we can think of this and say, yeah, she had great faith, but as you read the story and, and the craziness that she went through, it really caused me to step back and say, well, how in the world did she keep faith? through every circumstance. How, you know, her, her testimony, character of faith wasn't just a moment of faith. It was a movement of faith through her whole life. And so how, you know, I'm sitting there, how did she keep this? And God really hit me with this. So our story picks up in Luke chapter one. I picked uh, my favorite verse in the Bible, uh, the book of Luke. It has no relation to my name at all. Just kidding, that was a joke. Um, but Luke chapter one, and uh, uh, I won't read uh, from the start, but the, so the story is there's a, a, a really righteous priest from the land. His name is Zechariah uh, and his wife Elizabeth, and they were in their old age, and, and uh, Zechariah was fulfilling his priestly duties, and the angel Gabriel came down and gave him a vision and said, your wife is going to give birth. And Zechariah had been praying this prayer for a long time, and his first response was not joy, it was not thankfulness, it was not faith. Uh, It was actually the opposite of faith. He was in disbelief. He had no trust in what God and the angel had spoken to him, and he questioned it. He said, "How, how, how in the world could this happen? And it was more of a response of like, unbelief rather than like, okay, what tangibly is going to happen now? And so we, we see that Zechariah shows us an example of not having trust in God's word. And that is so timely. I believe Luke is so timely fitting that right before we pick up with, with Mary. So then next we see in Luke um, 20 or verse 1, or chapter 1, excuse me, verse 26 And I'm going to read some. It'll be on the screen, but bear with me here. In 26, it says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be frightened, Mary, the angel told her, for God has decided to bless you. You will become pregnant and have a son. You are to name him Jesus. He will be the very great, he will be very great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And here's what Mary says. Mary asked the angel, but how? How can I have a baby? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. So the baby will be born to you, will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative 
Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's already in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant, and I am willing to accept whatever he wants. May everything you have said come true. And then the angel left. So we see now Gabriel has, has appeared to Mary. Uh, we, she comes on the scene, pretty much a, a young Jewish girl, uh, really a nobody from uh, nowhere. <laughs> and, and Gabriel appears to her and uh, says, you're going to have a baby and you're going to have the son of God and his kingdom will reign forever. Pretty intimidating. And um, she... Uh, she trusted in God's word, though. You can see by her two responses that she trusted what God was saying, what the angel was saying to her. And there's, there's two ways, I believe, that to have this faith, like Mary, to have this faith that there's two ways that she trusted in God's word that helped her to have this complete faith through her walk. Two ways that she trusted in God's word. Uh, and that are so important for us today. So God just dropped this ultimate bomb on her that would change her life forever. She would never be the same. Um, it would radically shake up her plan that she thought she had for her life. Um, and it was pretty scary. It was a pretty scary bomb that God dropped. And she had really every right to be afraid. Um, there was a lot in the culture of her time, and she was engaged to be married, and that was considered, a, you know, as, as much of a commitment as actual marriage. Uh, so you couldn't break that, and, and she could be labeled adulterous, and, and could be shunned, and, and at worst, even stoned, and uh, her son would forever be known as illegitimate. Powerful, powerful stuff for her future that she's thinking in her head as, as Gabriel's saying this, and and we see that, so Gabriel tells her this, he explains it, and then Mary quickly hurries out of town and she goes to visit Elizabeth, one of her kinswomen, and because Elizabeth was already pregnant. And so Mary stays with Elizabeth for three months and comes back and now is visibly showing signs of pregnancy. And now this little town where everyone knows everyone, the culture is strong, the honor, the commitment strong, uh, values in the culture, and now she, Mary, can you see this from a perspective of a neighbor? She all of a sudden hurried out of town. Nobody know where she, knew where she went. She was gone for three months, and she comes back pregnant. That doesn't look too good, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially in her culture, it does not look good. And so you can imagine that the people are starting to whisper. Mostly, if not everything, is all negative. Well, why did she leave so fast? Who was she going to see? Who did she hook up with in this three months. She obviously didn't stay pure. Was it with Joseph? Or did her and Joseph not be able to, to remain pure before getting married? So, so many of these lies, and, and now she's being labeled as loose and adulterous and unfaithful, and it's shattering who she is. And, and, and people's words to her were so strong and so hurtful and absolutely could shatter God's plan for her life, if she, if she believed them. And it would easily destroy her faith. So how did she keep faith in the midst of all these negative words surrounding her? Well, the first point, she, she put God's word above everyone else's. She put God's word above everyone else's. See, trust in God's word, it means putting his word above everyone else's word. So how many times do we focus more on what people think speak over us and even think about us instead of what God says about us. We do that so often. I am the biggest testimony of doing that in my own head is, is just knowing what people are saying about me and caring. And I put that at the forefront of my brain and it becomes louder than God's truth in my life. And it affects his plan for me. And People could say, you're, you're not smart enough, you're no good, you come from this family, this family, you, you, you're ugly, you, you can't do this or that, you'll amount to nothing. Whatever they're saying in your life, it's so loud, and it could be so powerfully negative over you. But what you need to do and what we need to do is that 
we need to make the truth that God speaks louder than those words. And Mary did that. She focused on God's promise. As we read this story, the angel Gabriel said, man, nothing's impossible for God. And I I truly believe that Mary clung to that. She clung to the truth and made that louder than any other noise going on around her. She put God's word above everyone else's. See, Mary asked this question kind of similar to Zechariah. She said, how is this going to work? And I truly believe that wasn't a statement of unbelief or not, tr- not trusting in God. Uh, I believe that was a statement of faith. She was saying, all right, all right, Gabriel, I know this can happen. I believe in your word. How's it, what's my next step? Where do I go from here? And she already shows and displays her faith the opposite of what Zechariah did. He said it in unbelief, saying, what? No way. No way is this going to happen. And Mary accepted God's plan and her truth, God's truth in her life. She accepted that not knowing the outcome, not knowing the details, not knowing what was going to happen next. And that is so important. That's such a great example that when God gives us or calls us, because all of us are called, all of us are chosen in some way, God has a plan for you. When that plan is spoken over you and spoken over me, we tend to say, man, the details aren't written down. The map doesn't tell me every turn. What do I do? How do I go about this? And it causes fear. And Mary was okay with not knowing those details. She was trusting in God's word. And sometimes we need to be okay with believing the promise of God and not understanding the performance of God. He's going to perform He's already promised, so we can trust in the promise of God and not know how the performance is going to look. We can know that. God will reveal the the what to us sometimes, but he won't always reveal the how. Why? Because if I told you to go from point A to point B, and I hand wrote every step that you would have to take, you would no longer need me to get you there, right? Same with God. He's got a destination and a journey that he he has for us and if he wrote out every step of our way would we need him anymore absolutely not and so mary shows this trust in god's word not even knowing what's going to come even though she didn't understand it said she was fearful and confused even but she still had trust god's word was enough for her is god's word enough for you Is God's word enough for your future? Is God's word enough for your present? Is God's word enough for your past? Is his word enough? I love this because Gabriel, I feel like, can sense this fear. He even tells her, don't be afraid. Um, He can sense this fear, and he says, he gives her an example. Hey, look, Elizabeth was completely barren, and God did a miracle, and now she is going to have a son. And then he says, for nothing is impossible with God. I love the, the 1901 American Standard Version of that verse says, for no word of God shall be void of power. For no word of God shall be void of power. That's including his plan. That's including his promise. Nothing, none of those things shall be void of God's power. And we can trust in that. We can rest assured in that. Put God's word above everyone else's And you won't have to focus on the how. And you can rest in the what. See, Gabriel next. So she, Mary asked this question. Gabriel then explains what I believe was the original birds and the bees talk in a whole different kind of light. And um, he explains how the Holy Spirit uh, is going to get the job done. He's going to take care of her and lead her. And after that, Mary's response is so imperative. Mary could have responded like Moses, right? Five different excuses. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. I have weakness. Just send someone else. She could have responded like Jonah, physically running out the way of God's plan. She could have responded just like Zechariah with just unbelief and unfaithfulness. But she didn't. This was Mary's response. In verse 38, it says, For I am the Lord's servant. I am willing to accept whatever he wants. 
May everything you have said come true. I am the Lord's servant. So what she did here is she put God's word above her own. She put God's word above her own. She was humble and she knew that she wasn't good enough, but that God had called her and would equip her to take care of this plan that he had for her. Um, just as Mary put God's word above everyone else, she had to put God's word above her own. And that's my second point is we need to put God's word above our own. Because sometimes that is the most powerful voice, the most impactful voice is our own. See, I have done this so many times where I've gotten in my own head and started running with thoughts and letting the devil kind of entertain unfaithfulness in my own life. And Mary could have very easily done that. I guarantee you she was starting to think, okay, how's this going to look? What's going to happen when I get home? What is Joseph going to think here? All these, all these powerful thoughts. And her voice could have just snowballed into almost like Moses and just talked herself out of God's plan. And she, I truly believe that we can disqualify ourselves from God's plan. We can, by our own minds, by, by just letting our minds run and our own word, we need to put God's word above our own. And others, other people's words can be powerful. Uh, they are powerful against God's plan in our life, but I truly believe the most powerful voice against God's plan is our own. And, and that's really a humbling thought. That's really a scary thought. Because we can put, like I said, we can put a stop to God's plan in our life by our own voice. Your mind is powerful. My mama always taught me about the battlefield in your mind. That everything stems from your mind and flows out into heart and action and words. It all starts with thought. It all starts with your voice in your head. In Psalm 119, it says, For I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Later in that same chapter it, and, and, and later in Proverbs, there's a big theme about how our actions stem from what? Our heart, which also means feelings, our mind. And in this verse specifically, For I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The original Greek in, in the word hid, it implies to protect and the original Greek for heart here implies to it, your mind and your feelings and your intellect. And sin in this sense, just in this sense, the original Greek means to miss or forfeit or to lead astray. So listen to this. The, 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 the actual kind of context of this verse is saying if, if you protect God's word in your mind and in your feelings, you won't miss the plan or you won't lead yourself astray from God's plan. Protect God's word in your mind, and you won't miss what God has for you, because that's all you'll focus on. The opposite is true of that. If you don't protect God's word in your mind, secure it in your mind and your heart, you're going to miss what God's plan is for you. You're going to miss it, like Mary could have missed it. And Mary had to elevate God's word above her own. She had to protect it. She had to protect that promise that nothing is impossible and that word will come true and that she will be taken care of. Otherwise, she could have totally talked herself out of God's plan. She could have talked and disqualified herself like Moses tried to do. We need to do that in our minds. How is your mind looking when God places something on your heart or in your mind? Or, or knowing the commandments of God. How, how often do you, do I, get in our own heads and start snowballing? We need to elevate and put God's word above our own. See, later in Psalm 119, super long chapter, but one of my favorites, uh, just this theme of, of God's word, of the importance of God's word. And and this is what God's word can do for you if you trust in it. So, and, and these won't be up on the screen. I'm just going to read them off. Psalm 119, 
Uh, these are all from 119. Verse 37 says, Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. I will walk, verse 45, I will walk in freedom for I've devoted myself to your commandments. Verse 50, your promise revives me. It comforts me in all my troubles. God's word can give you life. It can give you freedom. It can give you revival. It can give you comfort. It revives and comforts me. Mary was able to hide God's word deep in her heart and in her mind and elevate that even above her own words. And we see glimpses of this throughout her story. If you continue, she comes back. She goes to Elizabeth and, and little John the Baptist in her womb jumps with joy and Mary just gets an overwhelming sense of joy. And she sings this song um, called the Magnificent. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's, that's how I read it. And it's a song pretty much putting God above her. Most of it says, he has, he has blank, he has done, he has done this. And actually, this song of Mary's references and quotes from Psalms to Old Testament scriptures all over, and especially the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Mary knew the word of God, both present and past, and she hid it in her heart, and it did wonders for her. We see that God's word was giving her life, literal life, <laughs> literal life to her. It was giving her freedom from other people's words and their thoughts and her own. It was giving her a new revival and joy to serve the Lord, and it was giving her a comfort and a trust to know that whatever may come in the next step, will be taken care of her, will be taken care of. If you need life in this place, if you need some freedom, maybe from your words, maybe from some influences in your life, negative and positive, maybe you need some, just a fresh revival of just following God's truth and his word. Or maybe you need comfort because you're going through anything or a situation that isn't comfortable. God's word is sufficient for you. Put that on the forefront of your mind and on your heart, and it will change your life. It will change your life. When I, in the high school group, there's nothing more exciting to me when a student comes up to me and says, hey, I just read this. This is how it spoke to me. Or I can, I can, a student will come up to me after and say, hey, you know what? Like, I was actually reading that chapter you spoke on. That gives me so much joy because there's nothing more concrete in the plan, in the plan making for those kids and those young men and women than God's word. And the truth goes for no matter how old, how seasoned, how young, how fresh you are, God's word is alive and it's active, Right? It's alive and it's active, and we need more of it in our lives. And I'm talking about God's word can be, it can be the Bible. It can be God's divine word to you. Is he speaking to you? Because he is. Are you listening? We need to follow Mary's example. Uh, worship team, would you come at this time as I kind of wrap up? And uh, I just want to give us some time to, to put God's word in front of us, to highlight it, to magnify it, almost like a telescope, man, putting that at the forefront. And I, I believe that Mary's example, not only putting that, putting God's word above any other influence in her life, even her own, she gives us a great example of a great way to do that by song. By singing with her voice. That was a fresh song that was inspired by the faithfulness of God in the past. And the excitement of his plan for the future. And she was singing this. And it gave her joy. It did so much for her. And so I want to give us a chance um, as we close in just a minute. To give you an opportunity to sing. Use your voice. Speak to God. Maybe it's sitting down and reading his word. His live word. He's got something for you tonight. He has something for you tonight to get you through 
whatever season you're in and to carry you through that and far beyond. Mary's character of faith, you can break it down and totally see how she did it. She put God's word above everyone else's and she put God's word above her own in her mind. That's how Mary was able to walk in the movement of faith instead of just a moment. And that can happen for you. Your life can be a movement of faith if you focus on God's word. Is God's word the loudest voice in your life? That's a great question for tonight. Is God's word the loudest voice in your life? It can do so much for you. Would you stand with me? I'm just so thankful that God continually speaks to us. Amen. That we don't have to just, that this, this word isn't just old. It's not old. It's fresh every day. So I'm going to pray. I want to give you an opportunity as we sing. Make your area an altar or come down to the altar and make God's word a priority in your life. If you need life, revival, comfort, freedom, joy, it's here for you tonight. Pray with me. Father God, we just thank you so much. We thank you for who you are. God, and we thank you that you are faithful to Mary. And God, we thank you that you're going to be faithful to us. We thank you that we can trust in your word. I pray that, Lord, you would help us to make it louder than any other voice or influence in our life. God, I truly believe if we do that, you are going to move and work in us more than ever before. That your plan can be made perfect because of your word. I thank you, God. May the promises of you and your word carry us through any season. Sunshine or rain, Father God, we trust in you. Help us to not focus on the negative of others, on what they think, even the spirit of comparison, Father God. I pray against that, that we would trust in your word for our identity. I pray, God, that we wouldn't get in our own mind and you'd help us with this battlefield that we're in. Help us to focus on you. Put your words and your promises at the forefront of who we are. Change us tonight, Father God. Reveal something new to us. We worship you, God, in your holy name.